So, Jenna Wilson, welcome to The Disenfranchised. How are you doing today? I am really well. Thanks for having me, Ed. How are you? I'm good, thank you very much. And like I mentioned just before the, the, the chat, I'm slightly uh, tired. So it's a great, <laughs> uh, great uh, that I'm speaking to you today because I'm going to try and pull out a few tips maybe along the way for myself, <laughs> <laughs> even though my tips. kids are, <laughs> even though my kids are six and eight and they're not the real main issue. It's it's something <laughs> else, but <laughs> there we go. So, um, so Jenna, let's, let's get going with the, um, the interview then. And let's, let's find out a little bit about your first job. My first ever job was, I actually loved it. It was a sales assistant in, um, probably showing my age now, there was a, a, a franchise of shops, funnily enough, called Richard's, Richard Shops, my mum used to call them. Okay. And I was a sales assistant and I love clothes and I love shopping. So it was basically helping other people shop for clothes. Um, so I really loved it, really got into it. Um, and I was probably, yeah, 15, 16, I think. Um, that was, I was a Saturday girl. That was my first ever job. And then I went back there every year after I came back after university and that sort of thing. So uh, that was my first ever job. Fantastic. Yeah, pretty sort of uh, standard job for a 15, 16 year old, isn't it? Really going it straight in and some money into I didn't retail. Even have a paper round, just trying to think like that. That was literally my first ever entry into the, the working world. Yeah, no, that's cool. And um, you mentioned university there. So I'm guessing that. that well, and I can tell already that wasn't your kind of lifelong ambition to, to work in retail, right? So, no, um, it wasn't. What, what were you studying? So I studied law. So I um, did a law degree and then a postgrad and an LPC um, and then qualified as a solicitor. So I was a solicitor for 12 years um, before I even thought about doing anything else. Wow. And which area of law were you focusing in? So I... I initially went into family, so I trained in um, family, crime and immigration. Um, so I was a police station rep for a year or two, um, which wasn't my favourite part of the job. But sort of, you know, being a sleep consultant now, you know, it's ironic that two o'clock in the morning you would get called down to the police cells. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I did that and then I, I specialised in family and then continued to specialise in care. So. When children um, were removed by social services, I represented the parents, but then I also went further and um, got a qualification, which meant that I could represent the children as well. You have to kind of do extra work and be interviewed in the, by the Law Society and that sort of thing to make sure that you're acceptable to, to represent children. So, yeah, I did that. So I, I didn't do any sort of glamorous or happy area of law. It was not a particularly happy area of law, I've got to be honest. Yeah, so what what attracted you to work in that area of law then because like you say it's not necessarily a, a glamorous or necessarily yeah, exciting the the it's, <laughs> no it's, it's probably quite harrowing in in some ways as well because mm. uh, you know mm. I've, I've heard lots of stories over the years I used to um, do work with Kafkas years ago recruiting for them yeah. so uh, you, you hear a little bit about what goes on there but also um, yeah some teachers that I know have worked in, in in difficult areas and yeah it's quite difficult for a lot of kids and you, you hear some of these cases and f really feel for them so I'm and I'm only seeing the surface level stuff right and hearing the surface level stuff so for you it must have been quite quite a challenge so yeah what why choose that area of law I God, this is going to sound really trite but I can't think of another way to kind of you know express it I've always and I think this kind of goes on to what we're doing now I've always wanted to help people um in my area of law and so you know if you're you know you're dealing with people who are quite desperate and you know obviously children who are going through goodness knows what so for me that was a really strong pull uh, of that area yeah. of law was to kind of help people while they're you know pretty much at their lowest um to to kind of you know to help people and that's funnily you know that's kind of one of the main things that I wanted to continue through when I was looking you know when I realized that actually I was kind of I was kind of done with um with care after 12 years um I couldn't stick it out any longer uh and so one of the main things of you know looking for another career or looking for another job was that I wanted to help people um when they were you know at their pretty low so that's kind of you know it's followed through to, to sleep yeah okay so so tell me how did you kind of a little bit more about that journey then so 12 years in law challenging area but you were helping people that was great so why, why stop that then and and what was what was going on at that point in your life I guess so I just had my second child I've got three 
I just had my second and I went back to work and I thought, oh, I don't love this anymore. Mm, I want my, and I wanted to be a solicitor since I was 12. So it's almost like a, I'm having a midlife crisis. <laughs> What's going yeah. on? Um, and so I, you know, I, I thought, um, you know, one of the girls in accounts told me I, I was being ridiculous and that I loved my job and that I just needed to get out for six months and I'd be fine. So I did. And I wasn't still love, not loving it. So I ended up seeing, a, I think, a, like a careers counsellor to kind of talk through and explore what was important to me. Um, and then when I, so I trained, I, I saw an advert for Sleep Sense, which is who I originally trained with, Dana Oberman of Sleep Sense. It kept coming up on Facebook and it would come up and come up and I would ignore it. And then one evening I just said to my husband, I keep, I keep seeing this advert, what do you think? And he's like, oh my God, that's your perfect job. You have to, you have to apply. Um, so long story short, I did. I trained when I was pregnant with my third and then um, decided not to go back after my, you know, my maternity leave, um, which will be five years this October. Cool. So wh wh why? I, I want to kind of dig into the kind of reasons of why this change happened. What what mm. what, what changed in your kind of feelings as to make, make you want to leave this career that you dreamt of since you were 12 and, you know, and and wanted to, to progress, what, what kind of changed for you? I don't, I can't, I don't, I, it, it's tricky. It's really tricky to put my finger on. You know, I'd had two children and before I'd had children, everyone said, well, when you have a child, your priorities will change. You won't love your job anymore, et cetera, et cetera. But that didn't happen. So I went back and I was like, I don't really know what everyone's talking about. Happily went back three and a half, four days a week, worked really hard, still enjoyed it. And then it was my second child that I went back and I thought, I don't, I don't love this anymore and I don't know why. But that area of law, um, and I, you know, it, it goes for a number of jobs, that area of law, you have to love it because yeah. it's so hard. It's legal aid. So it's not, you know, I wasn't on six figures. Um, and it's an area, of, you know, you have to love it. And I think with ideally with everyone's jobs, you know, you would love your job. Um, and so it was just a realization that actually I didn't love it anymore. So I thought about, you know, whether it was the firm, I loved my firm, I loved the people that I worked with. It absolutely wasn't that thought could I perhaps go into a different area of law could I perhaps look into um you know working for the SRA those sorts of things and I just realized actually I'd had enough I'd had enough of it all <laughs> just wanted a huge a huge change I suppose um it took quite a long time to come to that realization you know some people that I talk to now and they're at the beginning of that journey that wasn't like an overnight journey yeah. you know there's, there's two and a half years in between each of my children so it was probably an 18 month journey to kind of get to finding something that would that would tick my boxes yeah i think that's um it's a really important f point for people to kind of realize mm. that isn't it because you see on the face of it you know i always see on linkedin updates and someone's changed career and they're doing something completely different to what they were doing before and you think wow that's a, a big brave decision that they've just made on the yeah. over the last month or so maybe but the reality is it's probably a lot of thought and a lot of um worry and kind of talking yourself out of it almost that change isn't there because I, I, I've done it myself a bit and just think you, you get into that point where you think um do you know what I, know, I don't know if I'm able to do that you know will, will anybody give me a chance is it something that I actually really want to do because it feels like it's it's such a big life change doesn't it to change career going out of your comfort zone that much so um especially when you you've got a profession you know, it's, yeah. and, and, you know, for any job, of course, but again, you know, you, I've spent, you know, to qualify it's six years and then I don't even know how many thousands of pounds, um, at university and postgrad and all of those sorts of things. And so giving it up was like, am I being ridiculous? So, you know, what happens in a year's time if I think, oh my gosh, like, why, why did I give up that, that pay packet every month? Why did I give up the stability? Why did I give up? And, you know, dreadful as it perhaps sounds, you know, there's a certain level of, kudos dare I say with being a solicitor everyone knows what yeah. you do everyone's like oh sure. oh right okay that's what you do whereas you know you think gosh dare I make that huge leap going from a profession with a secure job with a secure pay to then being like I might no one actually no one might want to do this at all nobody might need sleep no one might need their babies to sleep no one might you know engage our services and so I had really quite relatively small um aims or you know things that I'd set for myself over the first few months and you know thought well I could go and get a job here and I could do this if it doesn't work out and it literally just exploded and didn't really stop. Excellent so what what, what kind of attracted you to the um, sleep consultancy world then? 
I, I get like it kind of comes back to this core really wanting to help people and I don't know how to like I said I don't know how to describe that really without sounding oh god like that sounds awful it's like she's auditioning for something um <laughs> but it's so true it's so important and and you know all of us are you know the employees that we have the franchisees that we have it's like a passion it's like you you are dealing with people who are often at the very lowest ebb of where they've been that they've you know had a baby lots of parents that we work with have maybe tried IVF or they've been trying for years and so there's this huge amount of guilt that you know that that what they're trying isn't working and we also work with a lot of professionals who are very successful or you know high level management all of those sort of things directors you know surgeons doctors barristers solicitors who have followed a path and who have you know, A follows B and then B follows C and then that's what you do. And if you do all of this, then it'll come out and it'll be all fine. Whereas obviously babies don't follow yeah. the rules all the time. Um, and so it was really, really important for me to be able to help people who are really struggling, but also help people and know that I can and know that, you know, we can we can do that. But as far as we can, make that affordable as well. So, you know, although our one-on-one packages aren't necessarily affordable for everybody we we as regularly as we possibly can try and hold seminars which are we run them you know for, for literally sometimes don't even cover our costs because we run them for like you know 10 15 pounds where you get all the information it's not just a oh come and we'll tell you a bit and then you have to come and work with us you know we really want to try and help as many people as we can and so that's also why I then did the the, the sleep charity UK they, they're called now they were the children's sleep charity um, okay. but they're the sleep charity because they, they merged with the sleep council because what they do, they're able to offer a kind of a, a limited service on the NHS up near Rotherham. Um, and so the hope it was, is that, you know, at some point we'll be able to get funding for us to be offered that down here in Bristol because yeah. we're based in Bristol. Okay. Excellent. So I'm, I'm going to keep on pulling you back to kind of these points in your in your career, just because I want to find out a little bit more about them and, and those kind of challenging kind of moments. So um sleep sense did the training through them was the plan at mm-hmm. that point always to start your own business or was it uh, to go and work for someone else you know what was that what was the plan at that point there weren't that many sleep consultants back I mean we were kind of you know five six years ago there there weren't huge amounts of them so in my mind really the only option was to start the company so when I did the training um so they they are basically kind of kind of I suppose it will be a license I mean they're American um and so you can use their logo and say that you've been trained by them um and they offer ongoing training that sort of thing but it is very much very clear that it's you know it's not a franchise or anything like that it's your own company so that yeah. really for me was the only option yeah okay and how did, how did that go you say it it went pretty pretty well and it, well you must have enjoyed it as well so uh, how long were you with sleep sense or or under their 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 logo uh probably until around three years ago uh so probably two or three years um and you know they were fabulous but we just came to you know came to a position where we realized that we needed to expand in a way that it wasn't possible to do um with them so we kind of made that decision that you know we needed to move away um and you know kind of not not be under their their brand or their logo anymore we've always been little dreams consulting so it's always been our company but um it, it yeah it just kind of came apparent that we just needed to to move away got you okay so you started your 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 company little dreams consulting after the training yeah from um, the very beginning yeah from the very beginning yeah. yeah okay that makes makes sense to me now okay cool and um you've you've got a business partner now as well haven't you so at what point did did that happen and, and why did you bring in the the business partner so it, it didn't, I guess it didn't start out like that, as with so many of these things that, that have happened. Um, it was a, a, a client, actually, who had said, oh, a friend of mine is wanting to be a sleep consultant. Do you mind chatting to her? And I'd had, you know, calls with other people who'd wanted to be consultants. Um, and, you know, so I said, of course, you know, I'll happily chat with her. Let her know what my training was like, that sort of thing. Um, but it was also at a point, probably just over a year in, where I was incredibly busy and also had, you know, I had three children. I had a, at that time, you know, a one-year-old. So I said to my husband, not that long previously, I can't keep going on like this. It's so busy, which is wonderful. But like, <laughs> what do I do now? Um, and this friend of a, a client of mine was Faye. And we were chatting on the phone and we just clicked. It was instant 
um, you know, everything that we talked about, everything we talked through, we were probably chatting for about an hour. And at the very end of the call, I'd said to her, you know, would would you like to work for someone, do you think? Or do you want to, to own your own business? And she said, well, actually, I'd like to work for someone, but I can't really see that's an option. And I was like, well, I literally have no details at all, but we could maybe meet up for a coffee and see how we go. So that's literally what we did. She had a five month old. Um, he came with her and we met for a coffee um, and just kind of worked it out from there. So we, originally she kind of worked as a consultant. Well, obviously she's still a consultant, but originally kind of was an employee for Little Dreams. Um, but like I said, we just clicked. We just get on so incredibly well. We're, we're very, very similar um, when we need to be. And we're also very good at having difficult rumble you know difficult conversations um and we can you know we're very good at parking those and then moving forward so that's kind of how it came about and so it was when we were thinking about you know obviously we've got becky and Draguti as well but it was when we were kind of recognizing that we were growing more that we and then we you know we kind of thought about franchising that was mentioned to us by um a friend who was working i think at the time for the bfa that we then you know decided to you know, to, to start franchising and, and become business partners. Fantastic. So I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but mm. I, I, I wanted to understand exactly what a sleep consultant is. I mean, I've got a, a vague idea just off the, the title of it, but uh, you mentioned there wasn't many around when you started and that was back in 2016, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I still feel like today it's not so much of a well-known term. Like to me, I hadn't really thought that there was someone out there to do this until until we met really I think I had a vague you know inkling that there was something around but I didn't really take notice of it so yeah explain to me a little bit about what a sleep consultant actually does as their their kind of day to day yeah well I think probably night nannies have been around for longer so night nannies are more you know they'll come and stay at your house live at your house for a number of nights or weeks and help I guess in those early days um when you have a newborn and what we do is different to that so we don't work with newborns we wait until little ones have developed sleep cycles so kind of around you know 12 to 16 weeks everyone's heard of well generally if you've got children you've generally heard of the four month sleep regression um so once the ones have developed sleep cycles we then a lot of what we do is education of parents so it's you know we'll we'll you know they'll fill in a questionnaire that's around 65 questions send that back and then we're able to prepare a sleep plan around their family, around their child, around their personality, around, you know, their child's age, all of those sorts of things and anything extra. Um, and then we meet with them. Since the pandemic, a lot of things are over Zoom because we realised yeah, that course. it was, you know, it just works just as well. Um, but we are now doing home visits, which works really well for our older children because we work with lots of babies, but we also work with children up to the age of 10 years old. Um, okay. And it's slightly different when we work with them because they are involved in what we do. So we what rather than you know the parents just telling them they have to do something we work with them and they have like a level of ownership and that kind of thing you know when they're old enough um and so the parents implement the plan and then we support the parents as they support their little ones so it's not us we do offer sort of the first night support so we can go and stay at a parent's home um and and coach them through it but it's never us doing it for them it's all about us educating and explaining so when we're saying well you need to increase your little one's awake time, for example, we, we explain why. We don't just say, well, because we said so or because the book says or, or anything like that. So we've all, you know, I think probably between us, we've worked with over 700 families. So that's kind of what we do. So it's very much an educational plan. Yes, of course, we say this is what you need to do and you need to follow the plan. But there's also reasons behind everything that we do. And also, we kind of want to set the parents up for the future as best you can with children. You can't really future proof. <laughs> for everything but you know if this happens and you do this and lots of parents will email us as they've sort of you know gone forward and and graduated as it were you know a few months later say I'm just checking this has happened I'm just checking I need to do this and the vast majority of the time that we're like yes that's all you need to do so we kind of want to you know them to to know what they need to do um in relation to their children's sleep yeah that's interesting it's so it I guess you need like good communicate to be a good communicator to do this role, right? Because that seems to be the main bulk of it. Yes. You've got to build that plan, but I'm assuming there's kind of almost some templates or I guess you're going to adjust it for each individual, but there's kind of blocks or modules that you kind of slot in to build out that plan. Right. So it's not like you're, you're creating something from scratch or am I wrong there? 
there are there are some you know for example if we would you know a lot of the time we say to families well you know that you need to meet your child's room pitch black depending on the age of the child you know it needs to be pitch black you know we might have a couple of sentences in relation to that so we're not having to type out the same thing but the plans are very bespoke um so each each family gets like a you know a different plan if you see what I mean and also the age of the child you know a four month sleep needs are very different to a five month and then a six month and a seven month so that's all very specific um but you're absolutely right you know you're working with people who are absolutely exhausted um quite emotional a lot of the time because often we're their last hope you know they've tried what the health visitor has said they've maybe been to the gp or you know they've spoken to friends and they've or they've tried something off the internet or in a book and and it hasn't worked and so they've kind of come to us and gone you're literally our last hope and i think there's a lot of worry and a lot of anxiety that comes with that um and you have to be able to communicate with people in a way that's very empathetic and very understanding but also you also do need to be firm you know with with them as to what they need to do and so it's it's a it can be a tricky balance um so yeah i'd probably say communication skills are the most important part of our job yeah, but empathy as well, you're right, because like you say, they, they're going to be kind of desperate at this point and yeah. emotionally drained, especially yeah. the sleep's so important, like we was mentioning earlier, really. Um, I, I remember, I, I quite enjoyed it, right, when I had young kids, the the waking up in the night, and I, they had bottles. Um, so I would do that and just sort of sing them to sleep, and that was all right, I didn't mind it, and then I'd go back to sleep, and then wake up a few hours later and, and feel feel okay. I wasn't too bad of it, but there were some days when I couldn't get back to sleep. And at that point, you're then just completely done in for the next day, maybe day and a half, because it impacts you so much, doesn't it, your sleep or lack Definitely. of sleep? And, and, you know, little ones, you know, little ones, especially of under a year, they might well still need a feed in the night. Often we work with parents whose little ones will wake up every 45 minutes. So they'll maybe spend you know, five, 10 minutes, you know, helping them back to sleep again, whether that's feeding or rocking or singing. But then the baby's then awake, you know, half an hour after the parents then got back to sleep again. And that kind of continues all night. And I think the tricky thing is that you probably maybe expect it in the newborn days. Whereas if you've got a 12 month old who's still doing that, there's no, you know, you've been doing that for a year and you're exhausted and there's no end. You're just like, when, when is this going to stop? When is this torture going to stop? Um, and so, you know, obviously, you know, little ones will need feeds in the night. And if they just go back to sleep again, then that's lovely. Um, but we're often dealing with parents who are literally yeah. getting chunks of sort of 20, 30 minutes sleep a few times a night. Or some parents that we speak to will maybe have to sleep with the baby upright on them because the baby wants to cuddle to sleep. Um, which, again, if it works, it works. When it doesn't, it, it's really awful because there's no, there's no control over it because someone else is keeping you awake. <laughs> so w- without giving away all of your secrets what are some of the kind of techniques that y- you generally tend to help parents with or, or offer to parents to help them to to get control of the sleep pattern I guess so generally the, the problem occurs because children are reliant on something to go to sleep or um, you know they feed to sleep or there's motion or you know they're co-sleeping and like I said if it works then that's wonderful some parents will do it and it'll it'll work for their family and that's great um but then obviously there are times when it doesn't and so what we help parents to do is to kind of remove whatever it is that the little one's reliant upon so you know if I relate it to to us as adults if we all come to bed to sleep a number of times through the night everyone kind of gets up in arms about the fact that babies should never sleep through the night and you know newborns are a very different type of baby so we're not talking about newborns now because we don't work with them but you know once little ones have developed sleep cycles they come to bed to sleep a number of times through the night as do we and if we've fallen asleep and our bed with our duvet and our pillow for example you come to bed to sleep and if everything's the same you roll over go back to sleep again you don't remember it in the morning but if you were to come to the edge of sleep on the kitchen floor for example you'd be like oh my gosh this is a bit weird <laughs> where am I um you know you probably wouldn't then roll over and go back off to sleep again you'd be go back upstairs to your bed and be like oh my God, this is weird I'm a bit a bit unsettled so if a little one's been assisted to sleep then we often find they'll have like a chunk of deep sleep in the evening and then as soon as the parents start thinking about going to bed they then cycle into these sleep cycles, they come to the age of sleep, and they're like, oh, hold on, you know, they might be in their lovely, cosy, comfy cot, but as far as they're concerned, they're on the kitchen floor, so they're like, quick, come and get me back off to sleep again, I need some help, and so that's kind of what we help parents to do, is is remove that reliance. Um, we don't, you know, we don't do quiet out, because you know, there's no evidence to, to suggest that that's damaging for children, but 
parents are going to do cry it out, the others do cry it out. They're not going to come to us and say, can you help us leave our baby to cry? Um, you know, we, we have different methods. Lots of them involve the parents actually staying and, and being with their little one and comforting them. Um, but we have a huge amount of detail around how to do that when yeah. we talk to the parents. So I think, so you, you call it cry out uh, mm. sort of style. So that's when you let them keep on crying and then they eventually kind of Fall asleep. lose reliance on any of those other things like a cuddle or singing or something like this, mm. right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I, I've tried all of those and, you know, those different things because you do when you're a parent, right? You, you see yeah. what works and what doesn't. And um, for one child, that technique worked pretty well and it wasn't too painful, lasted about three days and they they it. were good as gold from from that point on there's a few f changes and routines that we had to do but it wasn't too bad for the second child couldn't do that at all it i mean literally he would be hours and hours and hours and that's just not good for yeah, for any yeah. anyone right so we we realized that quickly and and had to have a, a different routine but i always remember somebody telling me before i had kids don't ever let them sleep in your bed once because as soon as they <laughs> do they're in your bed forever so that that had a determination in me not to to do that because I didn't want my bed taken over by kids right so we kept on trying all these different ways and eventually we found a route that works so I, I guess for some of your clients perhaps that's the same kind of thing right are you trialing trialing different methods and seeing if that works and that doesn't or are your are your kind of um, routines or patterns pretty this will work for you we do, because we have so much information in their questionnaire when they send that to, to us, the plan is already based upon the information in the questionnaire. Um, but obviously the, then the bespoke part of it, the even more bespoke part of it, we support the parents for kind of two or three weeks afterwards and we they fill in sleep logs every day. So we analyse their child's sleep every day and say, well, actually, your little one needs a shorter awake time or a longer awake time or we want to elongate that nap or even if they've just got a question and be like oh gosh you know he's woken up early from this nap do I have another nap or do I have an early bedtime we're kind of there to take away all of that guesswork so okay. the plan is bespoke for that family but then the support means it's even more bespoke because it's only when we see the little ones sleep when they're not reliant on something that we can then gauge what they need to do kind of what they're doing naturally and we can then tweak things so we make you know big changes in the first few days and then we tweak and say actually I think this needs to be shorter, this needs to be longer, we need to do this, we need to do that. And you know, so it, it, it's not set in stone from the original plan, because you know, otherwise, you know, that wouldn't necessarily be the right thing to do. So it, it can, you know, can absolutely move. And, and sometimes the parents say, you know, what? or, you know, the child, we might be kind of having the parent stay with the child the whole time. And the parent might be like, she doesn't actually care that I'm there. She's actually perfectly happy by herself. And so we then go, do you know what, actually, again, that's fine. Then just pop it down, leave her and see what happens. And often, you know, certainly after a few days, the little one's like, yeah, it's fine. I'm, I know what I'm doing now. So, um, which is really lovely. Excellent. So what's the the kind of typical cycle with your, your clients in terms of time? Yeah, it's generally two to three weeks. So um, we have a free chat with them to begin with before we do anything, just to make sure that we think that they're, the right fit for us and that, that we're the right fit for them and their family as well because you know we're not going to be for everybody um and then generally you know we'll have ideally a week to prepare the sleep plan because we'll prepare it and we go through drafts of it and that sort of thing so there's a lot of work involved in that but when we're supporting a family it's generally a couple of weeks um if little ones are in a bed then it's three weeks because obviously children who are two and a half three three and a half four have slightly stronger ideas about what should happen and be slightly more vocal about it um than little ones who are kind of you know five six seven months old so um you know children in a, a bed we tend to move much more slowly with them um mm. because they have very strong views about what should happen and what shouldn't happen <laughs> <laughs> has anyone who has had a toddler or a preschooler will attest to i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> yes definitely so <laughs> so the support doesn't go beyond those those two to three weeks then or or does it with the the client it can do you know we don't can get to it. the end of the two weeks and say oh well that's your two weeks that's your lot you know or we might be in the middle of a nap transition or your baby might have got poorly because you know it's a baby or a child um you know we generally work with families for as long as they need us to um mm -hmm. it, it, as an average it's you know two or three weeks but you know we will work with families as long as we need them to uh, as long as sorry, as long as we need to to get sleep to where we would like it to be because you know we're working with children 
we're not working with robots. So, you know, yeah. sometimes, like I said, little ones get poorly or we might need to nap transition or things might take a little bit longer or we might need to tweak things in accordance with everyone's personality. So, um, yes, generally two to three weeks, but we will work with families for as long as they need us to, essentially. Okay. But, you know, we won't kind of charge them extra. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm just thinking about it from kind of a, a business perspective now then because um, you, you mentioned your franchise, I think, was that back in 2021? December. December? Yeah, December, yeah. Uh, from mid-December. December, so obviously this is a, a business that people can now buy into, follow your um, training and and learn how to set up this business on their own. Mm. Um, I'm just thinking in, in my head about kind of the revenue side of things really. So um, two, three weeks, uh, you know, for a fee to come in, it feels like you're going to need to find quite a few people throughout the year to, um, uh, to, to, to bring on board as clients. So what I'm wondering is how do people generally tend to find you then if, you know that's that's got to be a, a little bit of a tricky point right yeah I guess because obviously a lot of uh, uh, there was a percentage of our work obviously which is word of mouth because parents talk to parents um yeah. so and that can be you know that can be previous clients but it can also be um you know at events and those sorts of things so um you know we do a lot of work with SEO and Facebook and all of those sorts of things but what our franchisees are kind of expected to do from day one is to go to events so you know already um you know they are you know, we've finished their training i think end of february this year um and already they're getting referrals in they have been for a couple of months um so you know because parents do talk to parents and if you know parents talk about sleep so often um they get a lot of work from that but also from the events that they do so um we kind of generally partner with other companies to go and maybe do question and answer sessions at the end of a, a you know a baby sensory class or a, can be a swimming class or all of those sorts of things so um you know we you, you, you know you can work with a number of clients at the same time you're not just working with a client you know you might have you know a few clients on the go at the same time of course and you get paid before you start working with them because that's you know that's kind of our, our how how we work things we in the very very beginning um I did say to, to families who were saying well actually can you can we pay you part way through or what have you and I was like yes yes of course you know and then they got the plan and didn't hear from them again and I was like oh okay now I've learned my lesson um so we you know we have full payment up front um before we start working with Makes families sense. um yeah and you, you know you can work with a few families a week yeah because and, then and, the, the support then kind of trails off as they they know more and more and so you, the support becomes less and less so you can then take on new families. But I, I think you you, the, you touched on something there that I hadn't thought about. That's probably something that's pretty rare in a lot of businesses and that's the that kind of referral piece because it is so strong within um, the parent community. I know my wife has brought God knows how many books off the back of somebody saying to her, oh, this book's yeah. great. And you, you, <laughs> whether or not that it worked well for them doesn't matter. She was like, right, I'll try it. I'll try anything like that's suggested to me by, by someone I trust. And um, yeah, if people have had success through um, the support you're providing to them, yeah, they're going to tell all of their friends. And, and I guess your market is so vast as in, most people have kids right <laughs> and yeah, I know not everyone people. but yeah and you know it's kind of a I suppose an ongoing or you know a constantly refreshing being really brutal um you know constantly refreshing market you know um but you know we work you, funny when you were saying you know about the referrals you know we work with for example a family in a, an NCT group might work with us and then we'll often work with two or three other members of that NCT group or two or three of their friends and we get people who've referred I don't even know how many people to us um and we always send a little thank you as well because we think that's, oh, that's really cool. important it's really lovely that they refer us so we you know you will you know as you kind of grow the more you grow the more referrals you're going to get the more families you work with the more business is going to come in and I think that's what I realized in the first year that you know because what we do is it works and we are all very empathetic and we are all very professional and we are all very, you know, aware of the most recent research on sleep and all of those sorts of things. What we do is, you know, we we're kind of saying, you know, we're experts in this behavioural aspect of it. Um, then what we do works. And so parents are like, oh, gosh, you're so grateful for giving us our sleep and our lives back. And, yeah. and parents are then able to feel like they're enjoying 
their time with their children, especially, you know, not being sexist, but especially mummies on maternity leave. Because often it's the mummies who are sort of having to then deal with the sleepless nights because, again, often, not always, but, you know, daddies are often going to work. And um, like I said, because we work with so many doctors and surgeons and those sorts of things, they've got to be on top of their game when they go to work because, you know, goodness knows what could happen if they make a mistake because they had a micro sleep or that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so, you know, it it is really huge. Yeah, but I I, I just think it's the best way to to market a business is the cheapest way isn't it it doesn't necessarily cost you anything for a referral um but i think you know by giving that that gift or a little thank you note or something whatever it may be that's yeah imagine if you spent that on seo what would your return be be (laughs) you wouldn't get the the, you wouldn't get one tail out of it would you or one client out of it so um yeah i think that's that's kind of almost your secret weapon is you're giving people their lives back and of course they're going to be your advocates for life aren't they then from that point onwards so yeah that's that's that makes it quite an interesting attractive proposition i think um Mm. so um i wanted to find out from from you personally what what have you missed from the corporate life then or corporate world now you're a business owner and you're 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 supporting other people start their own businesses but what do you miss from the corporate world? Do you know what? I think the only thing I miss are the colleagues that I used to see in the office every day. Yeah. That's, or, or, you know, even at court, because obviously I, I, I did a lot of advocacy by virtue of it being care. Um, and so seeing people in court. But really, the you know, the, the people is probably it. Um, the only nightmares that I have, <laughs> I have about work are that. I, 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 about my previous job you know about maybe being in court and not being prepared or you know those sorts of things um there isn't really anything else that I miss yeah so it's having, probably a good so thing isn't it yeah yeah no it's great and and I think that's the same with anybody who goes into self-employment but um I think the, the, the advantage your franchisees are going to have that you don't is they've got each other <laughs> to support each other through their building this business right and they've yeah. got you as well and and Faye yeah. so, so so actually you're yeah unfortunate for you but not so um unfortunate for your 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 you know franchisees and potential franchisees um yeah, they're I mean, starting I mean, this all... business they've got people yeah. around them to help them and that's really what we want to do in our culture um we haven't really worked out the proper wording for it yet but we basically just want a really supportive culture where all of our franchisees because it it, you know the it it can be not a tricky job but you know people need answers if the baby's sleep isn't working quite as well you think it was you know there's always tweaks there's always things that that can be done there's always always learning um because every baby is so different but yeah. what we want to do is create like a really supportive culture. And, you know, the girls that we've got on board already, you know, the, the franchisees, they have already, you know, they've been to each other's houses and recorded reels together. They're chatting to each other. They have been to meet out, you know, they've met our employees and, you know, we kind of all, we've got a forum that we can be part of and that sort of thing. So for us, it's, it's really important. You know, like I said, when I started out, well, like you said, when I started out, I didn't really have, a support network there were the girls that I trained with from sleep sense and I'm still in touch with some of them which is really helpful and I, I think it would have been almost impossible to yeah. have to have got to where we are and have felt you know that I knew enough about it without that but yeah our our franchisees now are going to have a growing network of advice and you know people that they can talk to and obviously Faye and I have a very you know at the moment we're we're franchise managers obviously longer term that's not going to be possible but you know people who come on board now are going to have direct access to to the founders essentially which um which is really which is really lovely as well yeah the people that have walked the walk so to speak so (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> so um we made all the mistakes <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly and that and that's that that's the thing i've learned about starting my own business is that it's just all about making mistakes and just um find out solutions something. on how to overcome those mistakes that's yeah. what building a business is right at the end of the day 100%. so um yeah it's, it's it's good that they've got somebody to follow and 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 how many franchisees do you have now We've got two. So we wanted to have our founder franchisees. Um, and like I said, they finished their training at the end of February. So we wanted to settle them in. And we're just kind of in the middle of our recruitment process, uh, like interview process with um, a few others. We only really wanted four or five by the end of this year because we were, because we 
I, you know, being a previous solicitor, I'm very um, evidence based and very um, high quality. You know, our, our franchise is high quality. The advice that we give has got to be top notch. Everything is is top notch. Um, so we didn't want to grow too quickly and yeah. dilute the brand at all. Um, so we're just yeah, kind of going through interviews with three other franchisees at the moment. So uh, well, potential franchisees. So that's where we are at the minute. So um, yeah, fingers crossed. We might well get to our aim by the end of the year excellent and um I've, I've got to ask you because it's in your title what's the what's the dream for little dreams consulting <laughs> in a the long dream. run um well we do we like i said we kind of would like four to five franchisees by the end of this year and then kind of grow at that rate for the next few um but we also do have european trademarks so um that's not on the cards just yet but we've had a couple of um people interested as well from australia and new zealand so uh that would, okay. that's not a that's not a very that's not a time led dream at the moment. We're just still kind of okay. We're still in our first year of, of franchising, but I know what we're like. You know, five years ago, I would never have dreamed that we would be here. Um, so yeah, we have a European trademark. So that's uh, that's probably the next biggest step for us in the next three to five years. Yeah, exciting, exciting. Have you? I, I'm guessing you've done a little bit of research to see. Uh, is there sleep consultants out there across Europe and a further there's field? Or? Yeah, the, America's huge. America, the, the sleep consultancy yeah. market is huge because I think more in America, you're very much used to paying for things already. Whereas, of course, we have the NHS and parents have to go back to work between six to uh, six weeks to three months. So the need for it is greater over there. There's not yeah. actually that many sleep consultants in, in Europe. Um I think there's really only two or three even in Italy. So, um, you know, obviously that's going to be a whole other, whole other different culture and language and all of those sorts of things. But um, I think our dream is really to just continue as we are and have the sort of team that we're building around us for that to continue to grow. Um, that's, you know, that's really our dream is, is, is the biggest draw of this for everybody, I think, really, is the flexibility of it. Um, you know, we all have children. Hannah's actually pregnant um, at the moment. And so it's absolutely something that, you know, we want to be able to empower mostly women. Daddies are very welcome to, or, you know, men are very welcome to come and join our franchise, but mostly women, mostly mums who have recognised that they have a career. They they quite enjoy their career, but it's not working for them as a family, or they may not even enjoy their career. And um, for them to think, you know, what else can I do where I can have a semi-corporate you know, life where I'm running a business or, you know, I'm, I've got a, a professional life, but I, but I need to, to, for it to work around the children because I want to be a hands-on parent. Um, yeah. D just going back to what you sort of said earlier about your priorities change and all these things. Um, I, I understand why it's mostly women because it's mostly women who are impacted by, you know, the, the yeah. child being born. <laughs> right. And yeah. um, taking, or well, have many months out of work, that's a massive disruptor, whatever the reason, right? And so mm -hmm. I can completely understand why people start to reassess things, look at it in a different light and think, right, is this actually what I want to be doing for the rest of my life? You know, do I only want to see my child, you know, for two hours a day and and that's it? So, mm. um, even yeah, I, I can see why you're looking at those. Sorry? even have time sorry I'm talking to you you know even to have time for themselves to think you know actually I want to do the school run then I want to go to an exercise class or I'll go to the gym and then I'll start work whereas you know if you're if you have a profession if you have a traditional job yes it can be flexible and yes you can do the school run but you know for example yeah. when we had that glorious weather a couple of weeks ago um I took my work phone to the pool and I sunbathed for a couple of hours and answered emails from the pool um and yes you know if I had meetings that perhaps wouldn't have been as possible but I can certainly you know work around you know make my make work work around what I want to do and I, you know I want to have that flexibility because I think especially post-pandemic people are starting to reassess and thinking actually there's so much more to my life than going to work and just coming home and maybe putting the children to bed and then having my dinner and going to bed that, that they, I want to do stuff. I want to go to the gym. I want to see friends and, you know, those sorts of things. And, and this makes it all possible. Yeah. Excellent. So I'm going to um, jump into my, my last three questions now, and I'm excited to find uh, out the answer to this one as I always am. And that's, um, 
I'm, I'm wondering what funny, strange or weird stories you might have from, from your career as a whole that you're, you're able to share, of course. Yeah, no, there's probably lots that I can't. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was thinking about this and kind of the weirdest one, uh, it's really quite gross, um, is going back to when I was a police station call out, uh, you know, a solicitor. And I, I started to, <laughs> I started to recognize clients by smell. Oh. <laughs> they wouldn't even need to tell me who was coming in that I'd be like, Oh yeah, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. And, um, that's probably the weirdest. There's probably not that many people that can, um, that can have that. Yeah. It's, that, <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I've just been watching better call. So I've just watched the last one and, um, no point anywhere throughout the whole series or any of his times is he kind of mentioned the smell of his clients. <laughs> well, there's not much air. There's no air in um, in custody suites. So yeah, and I, I don't know. Are, are some of them there for, you know, a, a day or two before you come to see them? Or is it just that's the... Gen- the some of them can be there for a number for a while because obviously I won't get into the boring legal aid cuts but legal aid has been cut so you know especially for example in there were some places in the country where they would only have maybe have one or two solicitors that could go to police station call outs um mm. and so they would just have to wait until someone was available yeah lovely <laughs> thank you for sharing Not the that most one glamorous with thing you've ever heard i imagine <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So um, let's jump on to my, my next question, which is um, uh, what what proud or inspiring stories have you got in your career or which ones stand out the most? For, for other people? Uh, for you. Oh, for us. Any proud or inspiring moments? Oh, gosh, I think there's just been so many, you know, kind of, I think getting to where we are now, you know, having launching the franchise was probably the biggest one, um, you know, having been a solicitor and just having this idea and that being successful so how successful the original company is and then um the launch of the franchise that was a that was a big one for us we're Faye and I are, are, are rubbish at you know we'll maybe get have short be shortlisted for an award and so we're shortlisted for um the British uh, British Entrepreneur Awards um and we just kind of go oh great you know we don't really stand back and, and celebrate it. We actually went out for dinner <laughs> to celebrate the launch <laughs> of the franchise. Um, so that's probably the biggest one to date, definitely. Oh, fantastic. And it is hard work as well, isn't it? Um, uh, I, I know speaking to people that have, have been in a similar situation to you, you know, in terms of time, mm. um, it, it can take like a year or so to get all of the paperwork straight and in place and make sure that, you know, you can actually provide a franchise opportunity that that works for people and uh I saw your BFA accredited as well so that that just kind of backs up that you've gone through it and done it all properly yeah. you know because I think unfortunately in the industry there's too many people that kind of um call themselves a franchise when really they've just sort of copy and pasted someone else's manual and just yeah. gone for it from there you know so um yeah, yeah. yeah good that on you really good- important yeah, congratulations, because it is a lot of hard work, I know, so well done. It's kind of like going back to what you were saying earlier about the LinkedIn posts, and you're like, oh, you know, that person's just randomly changed careers, and it kind of almost like, oh, you know, we franchise. Actually, there's a huge amount of, you know, a good year or so before that of, of lots of work and lots of reading and editing and all of those sorts of things. Well, you've, you've got to teach yourself a completely new business system, <laughs> haven't you, really? Yeah. So... Uh, and, and your role must have changed as well a lot. So um, yeah, yeah, it has. We're still doing the sleep as well. So we're kind of wearing a number of hats at the minute. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, still want to work with us. But, um, you know, we had great um, advice as well. You know, we kind of went with BFA lawyers and advisors from Ashton. So um, that really helped. Yeah, excellent. So uh, final question, and that is... Um, uh, I, I always like to think of it from the point of view of um, somebody who's looking to buy a franchise or enter into the franchise and industry, you know, what advice can, can I find for them? So I'd, I'd like to ask you what, what one piece of advice would you give to somebody who's looking into, to maybe buying into a franchise opportunity? I say, look to what makes you happy. Uh, you know, not from like, a, oh, I, you know, I like doing this, so I might fancy doing that. But, you know, you need to have find something that you're really happy doing and passionate about, because there's a huge amount of work behind it. 
So you need to be to feel really strongly and really passionately about what you're going to do. There's no point kind of just thinking you might give it a go because what you're doing, you're not really sure if you're loving it. It might be all right, it might be not. You have to kind of really have a passion and 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 go forward with that because it, it is a lot of hard work. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's your own business or one that you're you're, you're investing in sort of the training sport up front for a franchise. It's hard work, isn't it? Either way. So um, you're right. You have to be passionate about it because there's going to be tough times regardless, right? And so, um, yeah, um, you can get through it with a little bit of support and help. And I guess it's similar to the, the parents, right? <laughs> they can get through yeah. with some support <laughs> and help as well. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's I haven't yet touched wood um met someone who's made the jump who kind of thinks oh maybe it wasn't the right thing you know it's, I think if you're if you're unhappy in what you're doing and you're thinking of going for it and you think yeah I could really make a go of it then do it excellent At Jenna I think <laughs> <laughs> excellent Jenna thank you so much for your time today it's been a real pleasure getting to meet you and to hear your your story and learn a bit more about sleep consultants as well I feel like I know what I'm on about now if I say that to anyone <laughs> so uh, maybe I'll send some referrals your way as well but um, thank you again for your time thank you for having me Ed no worries take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.